true way, brother, that you. Oh, my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. I know sometimes you feel all alone. Call me anytime when you feel all the way down. Oh, 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 oh. Trials and temptations lie at every corner we turn. It's a test from Allah to see if we succeed or not. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين In the name of Allah, the compassion of the merciful, all praise is due to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his prophet Muhammad, his family and his followers all until the day of resurrection. I'd like to welcome every one of you to this new episode of Meet Your Advisor here on Huda TV. And of course, we do start with a topic but then our lines are opened for you. Our email is available as well for your questions. I do have some emails to answer. Tonight, I will try to answer all the emails that we have received for, so far. But let me start with this particular uh, idea. Normally, I take what I deliver on Jumu'ah uh, khutbah, or the Friday sermon that I do every Friday by the grace of Allah. Let me address this topic, which is the importance of purifying your income, your earning. Whatever you earn, whether this is coming from a salary of your employment, of your profession, or this is from a trade or merchandise that you deal with, you need to concentrate on purifying your income, making sure that it comes from lawful sources because in Islam it is so vital that if you want your life to be well to be free from all ter terrible consequences in this life as well as in the hereafter you need to purify your income make sure that it is lawful legal and free from all types of unlawful dealings because nowadays we can see that people are dealing so much with illegal ways, uh, indirect ways of trying to find and, and, and maximize their income, their profits in a non-legal way. Of course, Allah has made it lawful <clears throat> to earn, to walk in on earth, to find ways to uh, find a living to make a living which is which is fine on the on the other hand Islam does not want any Muslim to go <clears throat> and beg on the streets or to wait for people to give them food you know instead of sitting and uh, worshiping even even in the masjid or reciting the glorious Quran or try to do something good uh, as a worship of Allah first you need to uh, secure your income first then you go and, and involve yourself in ibadah of course you need so much whatever you have as enough or sufficient for you to go in this life obviously we need to do that and the, the only way to do this is really to uh, make sure that what you have earned is really pure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advised his messengers by saying ya ayyuha ar-rusul kulu min at-tayyibati wa a'malu saliha o messengers do righteous deeds and uh, eat from rightful sources um, uh, from all the good and 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 good bounties and favors that are available tayyibat the good things that allah has made lawful to you on earth and there are all of these things that are available for us are permissible. Allah created whatever is in the heavens and the earth is for us, for humans, to be used for good. But of course, He prohibited riba, which is to take more than what is permissible for you as an interest, as more than uh, what is right for you, because some people abuse the, the need of others and that's why they maximize just like capitalist banks uh, who try to uh, s 
sell, for example, houses with, with mortgage, or if some people steal or cheat on their income uh, filing uh, applications and so on, or if they uh, get something that is not right for them. I know there are some employers, uh, or I'm sorry, employees, who try to get something like they, uh, as if they have uh, done some work, just only on paper, but nothing in reality. This is absolutely prohibited, unlawful, and wrong. Let me tell you about the importance of purifying your income. That, uh, for example, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, who was a very famous khalifa, one time, um, one of his own helpers and servants brought him some food and he ate from it and he asked him, where did you get this food from? He said, well, I, uh, when I was in my uh, ignorance time, that is before I became a Muslim, I did something that was, that was uh, part of, of uh, actually uh, fortune telling and then I, uh, I, I, I didn't know that, but he said, I, I uh, deceived someone. I uh, made him think that I was uh, telling fortunes, and that's why he gave me some, some money for it. But then I ate, I, I, bought food, I bought food with it. Now it's available, and it, I, gave, I gave you from that food. Abu Bakr Siddiq actually got his hand inside his throat, and he vomited uh, and threw up everything that was in his, uh, in his stomach. And he said, Oh Allah, forgive me for whatever my own veins actually observed. And uh, look at the, all, all, all the ulcers and so on. What Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh was, was really doing was trying to not put inside his body anything that is unlawful. And he was following the instructions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam when he advised Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala an when he said, Ya Mu'adh, atib mat'amak tustajab da'watuk. If you try to be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you make supplications or dua, obviously what you need to do is uh, make sure that your income is lawful. Don't put inside your stomach anything that is not, or inside your mouth, anything that is not lawful to you. And the same thing for good, wise women who ask their husbands not to earn anything but lawful. Because they said, we can be patient for being hungry, but we cannot be patient when we are put in hellfire. So, this is important for everyone in the family, both the earner and the whole family members who actually eat from this uh, earning, and if it's good, obviously it will be reflected in their behavior, in their um, answering of their prayers, and body nourishments, and if it is unlawful, it will have its own effect on them. So people who are very righteous, would purify their income, look at something, everything around, they check around everything, they make sure that whatever they, 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 they do is right. Such as when someone enters uh, into a restaurant, or make sure that whatever this meat uh, uh, being presented to them is, uh, is actually uh, halal and purified and lawful, not only that obviously that it is uh, a halal in of itself, such as if it's not uh, pork or has been uh, made with wine or anything of any uh, prohibited substance, but then making sure that it came from a legal source, not being stolen, not being, uh, of course, uh, coming from riba, or even with some doubt in it. If you, if you have some doubt, then the best thing is to avoid this. As the hadith of uh, Al-Nu'man ibn al-Bashir, when he asked the Prophet 
so when the when he said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam saying, man ittaqa shubuhat faqad istabra'a li dinihi wa irdih. Wa man waqa'a fi shubuhat faqad waqa'a fi al-haram karra'i yara'a hawla al-hima yushiku an yarta'a fi ala wa inna li kulli malik al-hima ala wa inna hima allahi maharimuh ala wa inna fi al-jasad mudghatan idha salahat صلح الجسد كله وإذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله ألا وهي القلب. Now this hadith was reported by both Al Bukhari and Muslim and Abi Dawood and, and others. The point is, what this hadith says is, if you avoid doubtful matters, then actually you have been free from all troubles, and in fact you have purified your deen your uh, religious duties and of course your honor so people will not talk about you and say well look at him doing this and that and so on that would be really a trouble and a problem let me stop here and take this call from Wasim. assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh sheikh bas sheikh go ahead so uh, I want to ask you, Sheikh. I want to ask you that uh, that whether it is obligatory for the husband to pay the zakat for his the, for the jewels of the wife, or uh, wife should pay it. Okay. Any other question, Asim? Yeah. Any other question? No, sir. Thank you very much. All sir. right. Barakallahu feek. Now uh, that's a good question, and uh, obviously the answer is is I think clear, which is the, this zakah, um, before I go into the zakah, let me, let me tell you whether uh, jewelries, especially uh, which are basically gold and silver, um, whether we need to pay the zakah for or not. The scholars of Islam have two different opinions regarding this point. Because some of them say, if your own gold is for use, not for treasure, not for uh, business, then obviously uh, it is not zakatable, which means you don't have to pay as long as whatever the woman is using is within the normal. It's not really too much of a jewelry, or it is not really kept there to, to be like a, as, a, as a treasure, or to sell when you need money. Actually, you, a woman uh, bought it just only to beautify herself as um, ornaments and so on. So the point here, is this zakatable? Some scholars say it is not. The majority of scholars say there is no zakat in jewelries as long as they are used for um, ornaments. Some like um, some scholars, uh, the Hanbalite, for example, would say it is a must and you have to pay the zakah for jewelry. Um, some scholars say, well, in order to get out of this uh, difference among the scholars, it is better to pay. And really it's not that much. Suppose a woman has the value of uh, 10,000 uh, Saudi riyals of jewelry, of gold. What would be uh, the uh, zakah in this? It would be like 2.5%. 2.5% is like uh, really not much. Um, in in 10,000, we have 2.5%. Uh, that would be really um, 25 reals. It's not really much. If it's 1,025, 250 for 10,000, 250 reals really is not that much if you think that you have uh, a gold worth of 10,000 Saudi riyals in the same, with the same calculation. But of course, after year after year, it may take money because it, it does actually require to pay on a yearly basis. So, a, a, a woman has a choice whether to pay or not. Uh, it's preferable for her to pay the jewelry, uh, zakah. If she decides no, then she is really not obliged to do so. Now, is it a must on the husband to pay that? No, because the zakah is due in the jewelry itself, not because of the husband or uh, the wife. 
regardless of who the owner is, actually it should be given from the jewelry itself. Now if by selling part of it, if not then uh, the woman has to pay, because she's, she's a beneficiary, she's the one who's using it, she's really the one who's benefiting from this, even if he bought it for her, she is the owner, and therefore she needs to pay the zakah for it. If he decides willingly, out of his own goodwill, to pay the zakah for that, fine. That would be his, his, his own decision, and he's not obliged to do that. But going back to the idea of the importance of pure income, let me give you another thing, that the same thing that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu did, was done by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an, when he actually drank some milk, and he asked his own servant, where did he get it from? He said, from the ibl, or the camels of the sadaqah, actually charity camels which are uh, being given as charity, and they, they are there uh, for people to, to actually to wait to be, to be given. So actually, he, although it's, it's like for, for the uh, public use, but still, Umar did not want to do that, and he actually threw up that milk, and he said, I will not be nourished by something that I um, do not, that it was not right for me. Look at how careful these uh, scholars and, and leaders in Islam, and the, and the great companions of the Prophet wasallam, in purifying their income, they, they had no doubt, they just don't want did not want anything to come inside their body unless it was purified and and free for them to do so. So that is that is my point, and of course I'm uh, I'm glad that uh, we uh, we received a call during this. Let me get into some emails. This is an email from Um Kulthum in Nigeria, who said, "I heard a hadith that you will only be in Jannah." with your last husband in this world. Can I ask my present husband to divorce me because I love my late husband more, Um, Um Kulthum. Well, Um Kulthum, thank you so much. But look, you don't need to ask your husband for divorce because it is prohibited for women to ask for divorce when there is no reason for that. As long as you accepted that man, as long as you're living with him, and he is kind to you, he is just to you in your life. Why do you ask for a divorce? Now maybe you, um, you had more like, um, as you said, uh, more love and, and uh, an affection to uh, a husband before. I don't know what happened to that husband, Did whether he died or um, you just, uh, you know, he divorced you. But the point is, don't do it, because the point uh, is really a matter of difference among the scholars of Islam regarding this particular point. Because there is no hadith supporting uh, whether it would be for um, the one who has more um, good manners, or is it for the one who uh, would be the last one. Obviously, since sometimes we forget about earlier people that we... Uh, you know, get in in companionship with. All right, let me let me stop here and ask and answer. Um Yusuf, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, yeah, Sheikh, I have a question. Um, it's something that's been conf- you know confusing me and upsetting me because um, my sister, she's based in the UK and she's getting married. Inshallah, uh, it's been a while coming, but you know, alhamdulillah, she's getting married. But the problem is, um, the wedding won't be segregated. And I cover, I wear niqab, um, observe hijab, and I've explained to her and tried to give her nasiya regarding this. Um, but her husband to be and her, they don't believe that segregation is compulsory. Now, as her sister, I obviously have to um, maintain, um, you know, a tie of kinship with her. But I don't want to compromise on my deen. So, what would your advice be for me okay. Okay. in this matter? All right. Very well. Inshallah. Anything you want to say else? Anything else you want no, to say? Um, I mean, would it be permissible for me perhaps just to go into the, to the hall, to the place that right. 
they will be free mixing. But right. Sophie Culver just congratulates her and then leaves. Right. I mean, would right. that be an option, perhaps? Because I don't want to upset my family. I don't want to upset her because exactly. you know it's, it's a it's a happy time. Right. She's your younger sister, right? Yes, she is. Okay. All right. Shall I answer that question? Okay, to talk Thank you so much, mashallah. Well, let me go back to uh, the uh, matter of uh, Um Kulthum regarding the point of of being your, with your with your husband. Um, as I said, there is no uh, agreement among the scholars regarding this particular point, and that's why you don't have to worry about this because really there is a difference, and the scholars. Are not decided. Even some scholars said that it is not for the uh, one who's, uh, you know, uh, the late one, but maybe for the one who's higher in his good manners. Anyway, it would be, I would assume, inshallah, is something that you'll be pleased with. Both of you will be pleased with. Now, how would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala satisfy each one of you on the day of judgment? Because you'll never get, if you are in paradise, You'll never get anything that will upset you. Or everything that is in Jannah will be, alhamdulillah, something you are so pleased with. So don't worry about that. As long as you enter, just work on getting into Jannah. And I think part of getting into Jannah is to be kind to the present husband, to be really uh, obedient to him as long as this is uh, in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, and try not not to divorce him just only on that hope because this in of itself is a sin and you don't want to uh, commit that here in this life. All right, regarding Um Yusuf's question, uh, I appreciate what you are doing, alhamdulillah. And I think this comes out of your own devotion to your deen. And uh, as you said, yes, um, obviously it is important when there is a marriage that you separate men from women. You cannot mix the two because there will be some fitna going on. And obviously, doing this, you know, she will be dressed in a certain way. She'll have a makeup and so on and so forth. How could she be seen by men around? I mean, even out of uh, this natural human, uh, you know, uh, uh, jealousy or, or uh, need to protect your, your own wife-to-be, or at that time, that night, she'll be your wife. How could you accept that people just keep gazing at her and looking at her? That's not right. And of course, it is prohibited in Islam. Therefore, what you need to do is, as you said, even with, if you come with your niqab, come and say salam, and say, I, I, yes, I'm attending this, bring whatever gift you'd like, uh, give salam to her and to the rest of the family members among the women and your own um, close, uh, of course, uh, men that, who's a mahram of you, and then you just leave. That's basically the point. You don't need to stay in a marriage like this because it's not proper. And I think you actually hinted what would be right since you talked about this and, and said, I would not... I don't want to stay in that. I don't com compromise on this issue, which is absolutely correct. May Allah keep you on the straight path. May Allah guide her. But keep on advising her. Keep on doing this because somehow you don't know. You don't know. Maybe Allah will uh, open her heart for the truth and the same thing for the husband and um, make dua for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide their heart since they are Muslims and they want to follow the right path in this regard. Healing on, on uh, uncertainty because they don't know what, what happens in the future. That's why you take the risk and they uh, maybe years would pass without getting the, um, uh, you know, without getting the, uh, in any accident and there is no need or illness and so on and you may not need the doctor. That's why you need to do this and that's why it's, it's you know, it, uh, obviously... It, and certainly this is unlawful. However, however, it is permissible for you to do this as long as this is compulsory upon you and to take a benefit from it. As a scholar said, I have a break and I'll be back shortly. So please, stay around.
I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. Why, righteous companions, it is Islam that given us the sense of dignity. I love all of them in a way that you cannot imagine. That Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an would say something and the Quran would come down matching what he said. والسابقون الأولون من المهاجرين والأنصار والذين اتبعوهم بإحسان رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه Just compare, compare what you did for Islam with just one of them Of Noah. We're going to be mentioning uh, the significance of uh, the Ark of Noah. Knowledge is the essence of everything. Once you get the knowledge, then it generates the desire and the motivation, and then it brings about the action. And we're going to be discussing the state of the Ummah uh, and the division which uh, unfortunately has, uh, has appeared in it, and the methodology of trying to arrive at the right path. Your system of knowledge or your system of motivation are hit by any of these threats, you will definitely go astray and you will be suffering from a disease in the heart. We're also going to be discussing what Allah wants from us. How can we make that? Allah gave us the revelation. So Allah SWT is addressing first and foremost the companions. If they believe in what you have believed in, then they are guided. So the real guidance is what the Prophet and the companions were upon. Join Sheikh Mutassam in the program Ark of Noah and discover the answers to these questions. I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back and uh, getting into the question of dyeing your beard or hair of the your own hair um, on top of your head is that permissible where well, there is uh, some difference among the scholars um, many scholars said it is permissible there is nothing wrong with it however only some scholars say black is not allowed to make it black but you can make it like uh, brownish or you can make it like henna color if you dye it with henna which is like sort of a part of a red and brown and so on but some are saying there is no difference as long as is is this is people know uh, that you are uh, s somehow um, you know aged and they can tell the difference um, and there's so much discussion on this issue some are saying it is prohibited, some are saying it's disliked, some are saying it is permissible. So we cannot say that if someone does it, is he committing a sin? No. Because the scholars, many scholars of Islam are saying it is permissible. A lot of them, by the way, are doing it nowadays. And, and it really, by the way, is, is fine as long as there is no deception especially when it comes to marriage, for example. If someone wants to get married and they look at this man, obviously they, they will ask about his age, they will ask about his health, they will ha ask about his profession, his income, and so on. So it would not be, really, it may make a person look younger than he is in reality, but it, <coughs> in fact, it is uh, permissible according to um, many scholars nowadays, and therefore... <coughs> Excuse me, we cannot say to a person he's committing a sin in this regard. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this is a question uh, from uh, this brother who said, I'm a convert and I'm married. Oh, this is a lady, a sister who said, I'm, 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 I'm con 
convert and I'm married to a Muslim man <coughs> and my husband is a devoted Muslim and I see him pray, he uses a lot, he uh, curses a lot when he is, <coughs> excuse me, when he's annoyed. For example, while driving uh, or have stress at work, we are newly married and I uh, would always tell him, it is not good. And he says, I'm uh, quite concerned, especially when we get to have children. All right, uh, so advice, <clears throat> how I can uh, help him to avoid <clears throat> this attitude and apply Islam uh, to this problem. Well, this is good. I, I like the question. Thank you so much, sister, for such a good question. Because what we need to do is know and learn how to manage anger. Because we're not all together. Some people are just easily, uh, mashallah, created in a fashion or by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where they could control their anger. They're just soft and, and uh, nice. They are not really hot-tempered. But some are. And when they, when they get so angry, they transgress. And they started cursing and... Uh, and damning and doing all these uh, terrible things. Of course, we should know the rule of cursing because cursing is prohibited. In fact, it's one of the grave and major sins in Islam. And therefore, as the hadith goes, if a person curses another person, then that curse, because it, it comes from Allah. When you say, may Allah curse uh, some, uh, you know, such and such, or... Um, this person or that person, it goes into the heaven, up. And if it is applicable to that person, then the opens, then the, the um, uh, doors of heaven are opened for that curse. And it will be accepted. But if that curse is not applicable, or this person does not deserve it, then it comes down to this person, and it will be, in fact, uh, uh, wrapped just like uh, a piece of cloth and pushed again into the face of that person, meaning it will be on this person as if you are uh, calling upon yourself with uh, anger to be deprived from Allah's uh, uh, mercy because basically cursing is to, to ask uh, the mercy of Allah to be away from someone, to be kicked out of the uh, uh, compassion and mercy and kindness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one would like to have that because if a person is cursed, then that person is really in big trouble. That's why it is not permissible for you to curse. And, it, and, and Islam does not want any one of us to be to have a terrible tongue, a terrible mouth where you always curse and damn and, and um, have terrible bad words uh, that you uh, direct towards others. We need to always learn how to be kind, how to be, uh, how to have beautiful words that will soften the hearts of others towards us. And therefore, uh, what we need to, to do is to control our anger and not to get into cursing. What uh, you need to do is is try to be uh, is try to be kind to the husband and ask him to say, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. There are many ways if you get angry and would like to get into something terrible. First you say, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. Secondly, if you get so angry, you go and make wudu or take ghusl or bath because that will actually, because anger is from fire and water actually uh, quits uh, fire and extinguishes Fire. Therefore, it's recommended to make wudu. And if you are standing, just sit down. Uh, and if you are sitting, just lay down. So that would be, that's the advice that came from the Prophet wasallam. We need to learn how to manage our anger and be uh, good human beings because that will affect uh, 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 the person and the people around us. And I'm glad that you said, I want this father to be a model of his children who will come, inshallah. Therefore, they don't want to see him 
um, you know, hot-tempered. They don't want to see him do all these, uh, you know, uh, ill, uh, ill things, you know, t terrible things. And that's not Islamic. So I think by learning how to do this, to advise and to keep on advising and for him to take this, for example, but then if that all did not work, then obviously they may need to take a, a, a course or a seminar on anger management. You can always try to control your anger by really, really having some techniques. And these techniques are just think. First, when you are when you get angry, stop, stop saying anything, and and then secondly, say "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Change the situation. Hold back, and and if you do this, I think you'll learn time after time, and you might, they might give you if you take courses like this or uh, some workshop or or seminars um, on anger management. Then obviously. It will help, bi'ithnillah. But try to always learn how to say good things, even when someone uh, provokes you. That is not, that's not right. Okay, let me get into some more emails here. This is uh, Jibril, or Jamila. Jamila says, uh, please I want you to advise me on issues of working in higher institution that is... Um, uh, mixed with men, um, that is mixed of men and women, as a Muslim woman, can I lecture in such institutions in um, a complete Islamic uh, dressing, that is hijab? Well, thank you so much for the question. I think this is good, If depending on, on what you're doing there and whether this is needed for you or not. We know that Islam encourages so much the protection of women and trying to lessen the amount of contact between men and women, although at times this contact may be uh, needed, uh, but still, if that happens, it has to be in full hijab with no makeup whatsoever, and of course only doing things like lecturing or uh, saying something that is absolutely right, without any way of getting, arousing the uh, opposite gender, this is always important to put in mind when there is a contact between a man and a woman. We have to uh, lower the gaze of men to women and women to, to, to men. This is all important because that is the way to protect us from the shaitan and getting instilling in our hearts the interest in the opposite gender, this, which may lead into wrongdoing. So that is a sort of buffer zone or protection for us during these, these uh, contacts. So the scholars of Islam say, depending on necessity and the need for this uh, lecturing, you know, it's always better to avoid it. And many scholars, by the way, are saying, don't work in mixed institutions or workplaces. Avoid that as much as you can, but still, if you need to do it, if this is the only way for you to get some um, income or provision, obviously you may need to do it, but only limited, especially when there is no fitna. Um, if there are some men whom you think would be interested in you, not in what you say, but in you personally, then that becomes a problem. You need to stop that uh, you know, uh, obviously. But if this is all fine and you find that this is going to work and you only limit it to lecturing on the topic that you're doing and obviously with full hijab on you, with following the Islamic etiquettes and, and manners, obviously it may be uh, allowed under these circumstances. So all depends on the circumstances, all depends on how you actually um, lead yourself in how you act during these situations. If you act um, with full hijab, with full concentration on the topic, and, and there is no fitna, and there is no interest from you 
um, in the in the men who are uh, part of this class, or the opposite, if they have no interest in you, then that's fine. As long as you know, as soon as you find something wrong with yourself or with these men, then obviously you need to stop it, and you need to be a model. You need to be a good example for other Muslims in this regard. So the rule is, avoid it as much as you can, but if you need to do it, then do it within these circumstances and with all these um, criteria that are demanding from women to be so protected and they need to protect their uh, reputation as good Muslims in this, in this regard. Okay? All right. Let me uh, get into this. My name is Muhammad. I'm trying my best to avoid al-fahisha, both physically and electronically. Please, I need your advice on how to quit and pray for me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for me to forget it. I don't know what you mean by al-fahisha. Does that mean that you, you watch uh, terrible things, uh, blue movies, if you will, on on the internet, that is not allowed, and it's absolutely prohibited, and you need to stop it immediately. Don't give yourself any chance, and don't say, well, uh, yes, it is fine, it's, it's not really uh, uh, something major, you know. You need to cut it right away, and, and avoid doing this. That is the first thing. It's even worse if you come in contact directly because these go hand in hand, they, they support each other. If you watch these, these things um, on the internet or um, in, in houses that provide that sort of, uh, uh, of thing, then obviously you would uh, try to put it into practice when you go out and see women. You need to avoid that, you need to stop it. And look, look how shaitan takes you step by step. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the greatest Quran, Ya you alladhina amanu, la tattabi'u khutuwati shaitan. Or you who believe, don't follow the steps of shaitan, because the shaitan doesn't come directly to you and say, do this terrible and, and fahisha or major sin, but rather it will be, it will be in, uh, in degrees, all right? Um Bassam, salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum assalam, Shaykh. Yes, sister. I have two questions. Yes. Uh, number one is, uh, is it allowed to celebrate my birthday as our kids are asked in school to make some cards on my birthday? Uh, second is, uh, what about the loan in, uh, in the banks, suppose al Bank? Uh, okay. We are saying this is uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic bank. But we came to know that uh, they are taking fixed uh, amount of this riba. Uh, is it allowed to take loan here? Now tell me, tell me how how this uh, loan coming from the bank. What is what exactly they are telling you? Uh, yeah, suppose if I want to take a loan from the bank, uh, they are informed us that this is a, this is an Islamic bank as per the Sharia law. They take some shares, but there is a fixed amount. So if I take one lakh, uh, one hundred thousand uh, riyal, I have to pay back one hundred uh, plus ten thousand. So is it allowed, is it uh, riba or what, we don't know exactly. Is it Sharia Bank or okay. uh, uh, but they are saying it is Sharia Bank. Okay. But what is the Who says that? Who says that? The, the bank says that? Yeah, it's yeah, bank says that. Okay. Uh, yeah, but what is the Sharia Bank? Uh, the bank says that they are taking fixed amount of this riba. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Um Bassam. Well, Um Bassam, let me let me uh, talk about uh, first celebrating your birthdays um, or Mother's Day and, and so on. Obviously, we know that these things came to us from uh, non-Islamic traditions. They are not part of our tradition and culture as Muslims. We never celebrated during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu nor after that during the first 300 years, the celebration of birthdays of anyone, including the Prophet Wasallam himself. He never celebrated this. The companions never celebrated his own birthday. No one celebrated his own birthday because that's something that just came to us from later on. In fact, if we think that we are one year older than we were uh, one year before, then we should be more 
aware of nearness to our grave. It is bringing us closer to our death, not giving us um, more... In fact, one year has already passed, so we, f we should feel like we'd like to hold ourselves, um, ourselves accountable for this rather than to celebrate it. So celebration in that uh, sense is not right, and I don't advise it. Although some scholars said, as long as this is within the family, it's not, there is nothing. But all in all, many scholars are saying, it is an imitation of the non-believers. This is a non-Islamic tradition, and that's why it's not allowed. So, you need to avoid that. Regarding the loan from the bank, with interest, as, you, as I can see, if it's just only pure money, and you'll have to pay the extra amount of money for lending you that amount, then this is obvious riba. No one would say it is permissible. They may try to ask you to do something. Is that They say, well, you'll buy from us like this amount of iron, this amount of merchandise, um, lumber, you know, certain things that they may have, and then you'll resell it to them, and they will buy it from you with a cheaper price. And then you owe them this amount of, of money. That's how they try to do it. Cars, lumber, iron, bars, and, and, and so on and so forth. But that's, that's not, still there's some deception amount because you're not actually seeking to buy that merchandise, but rather just to go around, um, you know, this, this issue. So my recommendation is stay out of that. That's doubtful. We talked already about this in the earlier part of our program. You need to avoid such, um, you know, procedures because what they lead to is basically you end up paying more than what you uh, need, and they are just taking the, they are just benefiting from, um, you know, uh, what you're doing, uh, what you're uh, getting from them. And of course, they are just there, and the banks are there just to get to make money. They're not just there to be kind to people. So what you need to do is involve yourself in. In merchandise, try to get yourself into uh, work with others, um, make the money uh, work for you, wait until you get enough money to buy whatever you want, uh, be patient. Uh, that's, that sort of thing will get you out of the uh, out of riba, and I don't advise it, even if they say with their, their own tongues, all of that, because they all have these, you know, zigzag ways in order to make money, and they will try to convince people. Even if they say, if they give you a statement from a group of scholars, they don't follow that statement correctly. So you have to be very cautious. You have to be careful when dealing with these things because it's a matter of your deen. You don't want to put your deen um, in, in a terrible uh, way there. Okay? Um, this is Aisha who says, Brother, um, help me on this. I have been married to my husband for 18 years, all of a sudden he started dating two other women at the same time. And this has been on for 11 years. He has told me to get, uh, I told him to, um, to get married, but he said no, and um, yet he does not want to leave this act. What do I do? What do you think? I mean, you said all of a sudden he started dating. And it's been on for 11 years, and you've been saying nothing for 11 years? I mean, come on, sister. I think this is, this is something, there's something wrong there. And I think it started with you as a woman, as his wife. You know, wise wives would know what is going on. They have this sixth sense, I would say. If we have five senses for every human being, then I think the sixth sense is with women regarding their husbands. They, they are really, they know what goes on. They can smell, they can, you know, feel there's something wrong. If he's doing this with other women, you can, st you can still know it. And you can still, we're, we're okay, doing it. So it's, it's wrong. Uh, all right. All right. Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Okay. We got, we got him cut off. Um, anyway, it was, it was called, uh, it was called from Nigeria. And um, what I want to do 
is uh, is let me let me say this. Um, my advice to you is to ask him to divorce you right away. If he agrees, fine, because living with this man who's been dating women for 11 years is committing fahisha and he is not doing the right thing and you need really to stop this immediately. If not, then you have to go to the court and ask the judge, the, the Muslim judge, to divorce you. Because even if you make khula, this is not a man who's worth to live with. You, you need to get away from that infected environment. This is not good for you anymore. How could you accept it? As a wife, even if you have children, even if you say, well, I will not have anyone to support me, Allah will support you. Allah will support you. Shaykh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Go ahead. Uh, Shaykh, I have a question. That after the delivery of a baby, is it necessary that the mother waits for 40 days? Or if the bleeding stops, she can start praying salah after 20 days? Okay. All right, Sheikha, any other question? No, no, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So, my advice for you regarding this particular issue of this husband is please, right away, you need to stop to make an end to this. This is my advice to you because this man, he's, he's, he's being corrupt. It's, he's terrible. All right. My... my um, Answer to, to the to Sheikha's question regarding the stop of bleeding for uh, women after the post childbirth or after their their childbirth, if the uh, if the blood stops, then that's that's it. Uh, she can take a shower. Make sure that um, by inserting a you know clean piece of cotton inside the vagina to make sure that there is really no more blood. And if that stopped, then you need immediately to do uh, to start uh, praying and to start being normal. Uh, that is that is the rule. That you don't have to wait for forty days. That is what the scholars of Islam are saying regarding purity of the post childbirth, um, you know, boredom. And I'd like to thank every one of you for being with us today. Until we meet, inshallah, next Friday. I leave you with Allah's care and protection. Wassalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته. I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. I know sometimes you feel all alone. Call me anytime when you feel all the way down. Oh, 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 oh. Trials and temptations lie at every corner we turn. It's a test from Allah to see if we succeed or not. My brother, it's a trial that you're going through. So don't be afraid. Allah's there for you. So hold on, Allah's there for you, hold on, He's listening to you, hold on.